Hi guys, it is a gorgeous day here in paradise in the end times, in the Hollywood Hills, but uh, we're not in the Hollywood Hills for all intents and purposes. We're going to go over to Arizona uh, today, and I am thrilled to announce that I finally, I finally have tracked down my old buddy uh, and fellow doomsday tourist, Mike Sleva, and we are going to have a conversation with Mike Sleva. Before I turn it over to him, we're going to go over to his website for just a minute. If you do not know Mike, this is from his website, and we'll be right back with you here, buddy. About Mike Sleva, Mike Sleva is one of the foremost speakers on simple living. His presentations cut to the chase and address the trappings of a complex world. Whether you're an individual, institution, or organization, Michael has dynamic yet simple ideas that anyone can implement into their community. Michael lives a simple life that relies on the constant attainment of knowledge. He and his wife Karen are former educators who left behind their careers and most of their worldly possessions in order to pursue a life of genuine connectivity. For years now, Michael and Karen have been traveling, working, and speaking about what it means to live a life of simplicity. They have built a skill set that has allowed them to continue along a path where stress and chaos are left behind and efficiency and durability take their place and that is a mouthful and welcome <laughs> mike sleva to humpty dumpty tribe mm -hmm. it's good to be here thank you for having me sir oh. appreciate it <laughs> all right it, it, it took it took a while uh, for these two while, rolling man. stones to uh to <laughs> gather enough moss to be in one place these for... 50 somethings figured it out <laughs> Yeah, so I, I'm house sitting in California, and Mike's house sitting in a in Arizona. So we have finally found some internet. And, and yeah, real quickly, guys, there is a chance that this battery is going to die in the middle of this interview. In which case, uh, don't worry, uh, I'll change batteries and we'll come back. So anyway, welcome aboard, Mike. And uh, is there anything you would like to add to that short introduction before we dive into? Uh, no, I mean, I think it, 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 I wrote that a few years ago, and I, mean, I feel like it, it built me up more than I actually am now. I'm like, <laughs> are you, are you, like shit, I, I still drive a car and go to Walmart, so. <laughs> All right, well, uh, okay, Mike, we're getting a little too comfortable with the, uh, with the, with the body okay. lag. Okay, there, there you go. <laughs> there we go. This is a PG show. Yes, this is a PG show, and we have some foot fetishists out there, uh, at, <laughs> as it is. So, uh, anyway, uh, now I, I've already told Mike we are not going, this is not going to turn into a, a show about Guy McPherson, but we're just going to get this out of the way. I expect uh, that a lot of the folks listening to this have uh, probably know you with your connection to Guy McPherson. Now, when... Uh, one of our own tribes members, Sandro, was interviewing Guy a couple of weeks ago. He mentioned in that interview, your name came up, and he mentioned that uh, you 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 were no longer with with, with Guy. So just just let's just dispense with this and and give a a thirty second report on what that's all about. Then we're going to talk about you from here on out. Dun, dun, dun. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, so Guy and I, uh, we did a radio show uh, podcast, Nature Bats Last, in the Progressive Radio Network from August of 2014. And I think my last show was at the beginning of May of this year. And uh, I did 105 episodes um, co-hosting with him. And it was an incredible experience because, you know, I basically got to talk to all the people that, I, that really put me in the position I am now, which is, yeah. you know, house sitting. <laughs> Um, and living the life that I, I really want to live. So Derek Jensen's of the world, and John Zerzan, and you know Daniel Quinn, Carolyn Baker, and so on. And for me, 
um, after Guy and I decided to go to one per month because Guy was basically moving out of the country, yeah. um, the dynamic of the show really changed for me because I didn't have to be on and preparing every week. And so for me, it lost a little bit of momentum for me personally. Um, and quite frankly, after 105 episodes, and I don't know how you do it because you're prolific, I, I don't have a lot more to say about um, you know the Doomosphere. And I wrote an article, a weekly article for the Good Men Project for a year and a half. I wrote probably 70 to 75 articles there, which I just gave up as well. And after a while, it just got to the point where I got tired of listening to the echo chamber of myself. And I didn't really know what else to talk about anymore. And plus, you know, Guy being out of the country, um, it changed the dynamic yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it, it's a different thing because he's got to call in from down there. We're not, we used to talk every single day and see each other, each other every single day. And now we barely, you know, we, I haven't seen him since probably this fall. And so it's just our relationship changed. Uh, my attitude towards uh, uh, spending time talking about these topics started to change. I want to probably do a little more um, self-inquiry work on myself. Um, um, I, I feel I've gotten to a point where I've, I've awoken from civilization, but there's probably some other things I need to awaken to as well. And uh, maybe pulling back a little from the Doomosphere's probably the best thing for me at this point because i live in a really cool community with a, some amazing people and i think it's time to even take that skill set you mentioned before and improve upon that because i've been getting a little stagnant so. well before we get into that to the uh which i do want the focus of this to be i i do want to to spend a few minutes in the doomosphere because uh that's yeah, kind sure. of where where this channel now of course, well, the, first, the first question on, on my mind is, I, I know that the reason we couldn't have a conversation a couple of days ago is because I was trying to get my car fixed and you were going grocery shopping. So I know this is a question you probably heard. And so this will be my lead off question to you. Paper or plastic? <laughs> Actually, I have those, uh, those bags. Oh, you got your... You, you you got your uh, organic cotton yeah, recyclable. Well, I should say I do. My wife does. Uh, oh yeah, of course. Her, Karen you know. Karen Karen is the one who remembers it, to bring. If the, it wasn't uh, for her, it would be paper. <laughs> it would be paper. Okay. Of course. I mean, you know. that, oh, I see, this is a question that we paper. all face. That every one of yeah. us faces because we all forget to bring our damn bag. So anyway, right. you're going with paper. Okay, he is okay. a paper man. Now of course, yeah. Oops, the, now of course, the other battery just turned green. Uh, You're set. <laughs> so we have a backup battery. Okay. All right. Seriously, though. Okay. Uh, how? Just b before we we dive into the bigger question of of what we as individuals can do about it. Where are you in the doomosphere, as you call it right now? How would you? describe the state of planet earth in a nutshell in summer of 2017 yeah we're um we're fucked <laughs> i mean we are uh obviously you know we got this heat wave going around the, the globe at the moment but you know i think people kind of get distracted by that and go you know oh yeah look at what's going on but things have been going on for a very long time i just don't see you know i, I talk to folks a lot about these things and i get interviewed every once in a while um and it seems that when I talk to what I call the general population, people think we're just going to have this sort of epiphany as um, as a civilized culture and sort of wake up to what we've been doing. And I don't see I don't see any evidence of that in what I observe. And I always tell people, if you want to really know what's going on, just go sit in a mall for about 15 minutes on a bench and watch people mm -hmm. and then ask, what are these people doing and where is all this shit eventually going? And you'll 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 just you start to just think about that. You don't even have to know anything about science and the weather or climate. <laughs> and, and, and you can tell we are we're we're fucked because people have no idea what they're doing. They're just on autopilot, and that they're not living with any sort of intent. And and that's really what I just I don't see any evidence of this turning around. I don't know when it's going to go down, and I, and that's one of the things I really I don't really fucking care, and I don't I don't try to fixate on that, and so. Yeah, we're screwed. <laughs> uh, so, so that that that's I'm not the, an optimist. 
DJ, you are you are not an optimist. No. Yes, I, I was. We were doing some uh, ha having some fun with a, a recent video on someone else whose name we won't go into, whether or not he's an optimist or not. I know that's why I, I said it because I saw the video right before. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 anyway, so you are not an optimist. I am so, not an so optimist. So welcome to the non-optimist club. Now, uh, I. While we were talking before, I, I did determine, of course, which would always one of my number one questions. Uh, you you do not have children, which is no. probably one of the reasons you have the freedom not to be an optimist. Can, can you talk about the, about that? When did you uh, decide you were not going to to have children? And did it have yeah. anything to do with the state of the planet, your decision? No, it didn't. I mean, it was pure coincidence. I, my wife and I, when we started dating, we, we and I don't remember exactly how, the conversation, but it, it basically determined that we both really liked our lives. And as we started to date more and eventually get married, we, we still enjoyed our lives. We had a, a great life prior to leaving um, our jobs and doing this. Um, and so we never really wanted to roll the dice and, and, and change our lives. I mean, it, it, it sounds sort of selfish, but we really liked the way things were going. And to throw a kid in the mix, we knew that anything that we were experiencing would be gone instantly. And we watched friends and family have kids, and we just saw the consequences of that. And they, they would say things like, oh, yeah, but, you know, it takes your life into a different place. And I'm sure it does. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure it does, too. That's why I don't I'm have sure it. I'm sure it's great <laughs> to some aspects, but I really had a kick-ass life up, you know, and I still do, and I just didn't want to fuck with it. There you go. Okay. So we both I, agree on it. I, I, like, I like your honesty, brother. But it was not a direct result of uh, of looking at the state of the planet and and, no. and I was married in ninety four and I didn't really start thinking about these things until about two thousand four through two thousand five. Really? So, so you started. So you're fifty years old now. Yeah, I just uh, turned fifty. So happy fiftieth birthday! This man just turned fifty a couple of weeks ago. Appreciate so, it. Happy birthday! Welcome, welcome to the fifties. I tell you, it's it's, it's 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 not for pussies anyway. Uh, so you mentioned, so you've just been down this rabbit hole. You you just said two thousand four. Was there a a particular event in 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 two thousand four? Any one particular event you can credit or blame? Um, I, I think what actually started to happen is I started to look at the, um, my, for lack of a better term, my, my own demographic. I started to really get exposed to what it, what, what it meant to be a white, straight male in the civilized world. And I started to really dissect and peel back layers of, of who I was and where I sat on the hierarchy and what that meant not only to, you know, society but the planet at large and and so things like that just started to really um to, to happen for me um people i had met um i started to do a little bit of speaking about uh white privilege male privilege patriarchy and things like that and um once i became a teacher i became a teacher in like 1999 and i went to the other side of the desk and i was no longer the student i felt a certain responsibility for the information that i was delivering. Yeah. So I took my, that's really when I received my education, when I became a teacher. And so by about 2004, I was starting to really unravel um, who I was and where I stood in, in the greater scope of things. And by 2011, I was out the door and um, growing my hair out, apparently. So you and you and your wife were both, were both teachers as, as, yeah, 2011, and it's and so your decision just to to walk away from it. Uh, yeah. How from from the time you first started getting that uh, that idea to the time you actually did it? Yeah. Uh, are we talking one year? So it sounds like seven years. Yeah. Actually. Well, I mean, I met I actually guy um, guy McPherson wrote an article. Um, an op-ed piece in the Arizona Republic, and my dad had a habit of showing me op-ed pieces that he thought were kind of uh, goofy and loony, and he showed me Guy's piece, and it was titled something like, It's the End of the World as We Know It, and it was about peak oil and the collapse yeah. of the industrial model, 
And he gave it to me, and I took it to work and showed it to my colleagues, and we all kind of laughed a little, but then we're like, well, maybe we should look into this a little. And we actually ended up calling Guy in a conference call during our lunch period one day, and um, as you've heard, you know, Guy's got this very dry delivery, and very matter-of-fact, and we, we listened to him for about a half hour, and it really started to hit home for us, and it obviously it hit home a lot harder for me than them because I'm the only guy doing this. <laughs> um, and that was 2008. By 2011, um, I was in full unravel, and I knew that the job that I was doing on some level, on a bigger, a pretty big level, was really perpet- perpetuating um, a model that was devouring the planet. And I, I just, I, I did, I no longer believed in it in any level. And I, I said, like, I got to get out of teaching. And I don't really want to have a job job because uh, I don't want to produce anything. And uh, and so how can I do this? And so we went out the door, discovered woofing, and really started to figure out what not to do by living with folks. Because all the folks we stayed with had gone out, lived very rural, bit off more than they could chew, basically took the life that they had in an urban setting, brought it to a rural setting, and were overwhelmed. And so we, and they needed woofers. They needed people to work on the property. And Karen and I at that point knew that we didn't want to own and we didn't want to do this ourselves. And so we started looking for community and uh, eventually um, attentional communities. And we were fortunate enough to find one not too far away from where uh, we first started down by Guy. So you are uh, living in, t- tell us a little bit about the intentional community that ha- how it's set up and do you recommend the model to other people going down this this road thinking about this right now yeah i mean there's a ton of intentional communities out there there's a database for it if you just google intentional communities the database is the first link and i spent uh many of our just searching and 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 narrowing down my search for the types of folks i wanted to live with and it's in the states i wanted to live in and i did that for a long time and what I and I read some books about it, and what I found out just by reading and making a visit or two is that most of the intentional communities that are out there, it's it's not this you know it's not a utopia. They're just as dysfunctional as any sort of neighborhood sometimes, <laughs> um, if not more. But what they're doing is they're doing something intentionally. In other words, they just buy a house in a fucking HOA neighborhood and they're living there and they can just sell it anytime. They've committed to trying something, a model. And um, sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't, and it's, it's, it's not an, an easy thing to do. And we were fortunate enough to find a community that I call the most unintentional, intentional community I've ever been in or seen or read about or witnessed and taken part in. Because most of the folks that I live with had no intention yeah. of starting a community or remaining in this one very long. They were just like, I'm just going to stay here until it gets shitty, and then I'm leaving. And it never got shitty enough where they left, and it just ended up being a bunch of people who were highly independent, highly skilled, forming this community. And I was fortunate enough with my wife to be accepted into it. And I so you weren't one of the original members. You came. No, you came I, mean, in I don't late. know shit compared to these folks. I mean, these are these were hardcore some of the guys. Most uh... Talented, wise individuals I've ever met. I mean, we have four folks that are, you know, in their 70s, a couple folks in their 60s. We're kind of on the lower end. And so what's nice is we can do the heavy lifting and pick up some of the skills because, you know, master growers, master builders, um, and and very and know how to live without a lot of stress in their lives. So it was really uh, it's in a it's a magical fit. I don't know how it happened. I think uh, there's a fair amount of luck involved in what happened to us. So. Well, I think, I mean, it, what I feel like in so many of these, I, I lived on an unintentional community myself in, uh, in, in Austin, Texas, but it seems to me like there, there has to be a central figure. At some point, somebody has to be the boss. Is, is, are, are you guys actually avoiding that you're you yeah you totally... know we've actually we we sort of had that um not not while i've been here i've only been on the property 18 months but they, they sort of had a central figure i mean everything was done is done by consensus so there's only like about a dozen of us so um it's not a, a huge yeah. um huge deal to get something done but once we started to what we call rotate 
um, the presidency, which is basically just putting your name on a piece of paper because it's a, it's a nonprofit. Yeah. And once we start to rotate the facilitating of a meeting, um, because this group is totally anti-meeting. If we don't have to have a meeting, we don't fucking have one. All right. And so we have a meeting every three to four months if we have to. And we do not have a central person who is in charge. And since it's become more like that, it has become from what I've gathered from talking to folks who've been there for years, much, much more smooth. There's not, there's, but everybody lives highly independently and we have group spaces. So it's a, it's a good balance. Like everybody has their own sort of what I would call um, income. Um, you know, they have their own money. And they have their own space. Have they have their separate that, space. Yeah. yeah, we have our own separate space, but we also have a community kitchen, but everybody else has a place where they can cook if they need to on their own. We have a community uh, bathhouse that has a shower and a yeah. tub. A sauna. We have community gardens, but we all have our own little gardens too. So it's kind of a good mix of if I want to participate in this, like we'll all go in together. If somebody wants to raise pigs, you know, who wants to do that? Four or five of us will do it for a season. We'll raise pigs and then maybe we'll do it again in two years. And it might be a different group of four or five that do it depending on who needs meat or whatever. So there's a lot of that. Um, it's, it's really ideal. I went to visit an uh, um, a intentional community in Missouri that had about 70 members. And incredibly great people, yeah. brutally honest about how it was to live there. But holy fuck, was it! It was so dysfunctional because they had more <laughs> committees than they had people. Yeah, and I, yeah. I laughed, that, that, like, that that's the joke, opposite right? uh, extreme from the my. Yeah. Oops. What happened here? 